Yeah, hard. Let's talk sports as Bob Silverman does. As uh, I don't even know what I like. He threw me off as we were getting ready to start the sports reporters assemble opening because all I heard was sports talk hard from Bob as we were getting started here, and I didn't know where that sentence was going. Uh, Bob Silverman's here. Andrew no Hammond is here, as they are every Saturday afternoon. Andrew, Bob, how are you guys? Yeah, all right. <laughs> I would I would like news to not break, yeah. Uh, till at least Tuesday. Okay. Um, yeah, it's been a busy couple of days. And it, but I love how it impacts all of our sectors of and all of our areas of expertise. Yeah. And it's sure. all just a um, a crap storm. I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna see if I can keep it PG this week. Keep it PG. Uh, yeah, no, I, I saved all of my ranting because my mom FaceTimed me this morning half asleep. I'm just like, hi, how are you? She's like, how was work this week? And then I just exploded. I was just mad. Oh, I'm not mad necessarily, but just like, hey, news. Stop newsing. Mm-hmm. I would I would enjoy that, but it's fine. It's, it's been a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it's a holiday weekend, right? The uh, this is a I don't know. Three day weekend. I, it's a three day weekend, but I um let me just go ahead and tell you with the fireworks already starting to go off last night and having a dog, fi- like Thoughts it is, is it's horrific, and they're just uh-huh. traumatized for the entire weekend. It's not even just a day anymore. When did July Fourth weekend turn into a whole weekend of fireworks and not just the day of? Now it's days. Hey, do you guys remember in 2020 mm. when there were a whole bunch of conspiracies that the government was setting off fireworks to mess with people's minds? Wait, was that real? Yeah, no, that it didn't really real. happen. Well, no, I'm saying with that a real, real theory. I don't remember this. That was a real theory. You mm. need to spend some time in the danker corners of the internet. <laughs> I'm good. Bob. Yeah, Actually, I don't want that, fine. Bob. You guys don't know. I got it. I got it covered. I got this beat locked down. You really do. I've got mm. that. You don't need to know. You've mm-hmm. shown us you've shown us the dank and dark parts of the interwebs, and uh, I'm just gonna tell you right now, I don't want to uh, go any further. There you go. Okay. Because th- okay. there there was one thing that you told me last year about a theory that was going on on a story you were working um, regarding uh, a certain fighting league. Okay. Yeah. 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 That, and I haven't got. I, I haven't gotten that story, so let's just keep it in those yeah, parameters. I just yeah. remember you were talking about that, and you gave, and I'm just over here, like my brain cells are trying to operate, and it's like, what in the hell is this? Yeah, I I expose myself to some bad things. I, I have a Silkworth shower installed, so it's not a problem. I can just... You have a what? It's a joke. Okay. You know the the detox. Did you see the movie Silkwood? It mm, was came yes. out before both of you were born. Uh, I've not. actually seen them. I, I've actually seen it because I had to uh, watch it for a class. Well, yeah. What uh, what, what a, state does it take place in, Bob? Uh, is it in Michigan? I don't <clears> remember. Wrong, Oklahoma. It's in Oklahoma. Okay. Yeah. Uh, whistleblower. SEC country, Oklahoma. People forget. Talks about talks about a. Uh, about about uh, dangerous and illegal procedures at a at a uh, nuclear facility, and if there is a breach and they get infected with radiation, they literally they have to blast her with a hose in order to sort of make sure she doesn't die. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the Silkwood shower. It, Google it, kids. Uh-huh. You get the you get the answer. In any case. How does this relate to Judy, Rudy Gobert getting traded to the, the Minnesota Timberwolves, Bob? I don't know. You want to talk about What's Rudy Gobert? Are it the really Jazz doesn't. Doing? No, the Jazz are fine. That's a good trade for the Jazz. That, that it, it, it's Do you know weird. What, here's a conspiracy is theorist. It? Here it is. Here's a conspiracy theorist. They got theory. as much as Paul George as is uh, as which whichever Oklahoma City got for Paul George mm. when the Clippers traded him. They got everybody. You know what they're doing? For a Andrew, 30 year old center who's being paid like 42 odd million dollars a year, and mm-hmm. you have to take off the court in playoff games. If we're talking the cruel logic of NBA team building, mm. I think I think Danny Ainge at all made out quite well. Yeah. 
I uh, I want to believe that they were like, we can't be good with these uniforms, so we need to be in a rebuild situation where <laughs> we, these not, black and the black and highlighter is only not, for a rebuild, and we associate we it with have, a bad time in jazz we basketball. Have covered the jazz uniform. Uh, okay. We've covered him, but I'm saying like they're gonna only be bad with these uniforms, and it cannot be a coincidence that they elected now with a uniform it, rebrand it, to be it, bad it, for it, five it years. Can be a coincidence. I, 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 I will say this in, in terms of what the Jazz are doing. Mm -hmm. I made this point during the playoffs when I was like, oh, they're basically just going to waste this window that they've created for themselves. Because I still Windows think they're closed, not... man. Huh? Oh, yeah, closed. yeah. That, that mm -hmm. window's closed. Like, I'm talking about this was during the playoffs. Okay. I was this like, year. Yeah, this year. I was like, they're going to waste this window that they created for themselves. And like, they didn't do anything with it. And somebody brought in, <clears throat> somebody brought up the fact, oh, well, they picked up uh, Mike, Mike Conley. Conley. And I'm just like, really? That Mike Conley, I think the Jazz, given the two stars that they managed to draft, one. Donovan Mitchell with the 13th pick and Rudy Bear with the 27th pick. They put good pieces around it, but those players were not transcendent enough to lead that team to a title. They were an excellent regular season team. They won a ton of games. This is that, look, the Dennis Lindsay era in Utah history has to be considered a ginormous success. It was just time for it to be over. Yeah. And they got a haul. Whether or not they keep Donovan Mitchell, too, they've, there are conflicting reports coming out of Utah. Andy Larson, who covers the team for the Salt Lake Trib, uh, says that might not be the case. Um, the uh, Tony Jones at the Athletic says that probably for now they are keeping Donovan Mitchell, but like that team is going to be bad for for a bit. Do you think it's going to be a Godfather offer? I said uh, what the what the rumor. The I mean, look, if the Gobert package was five first round draft picks and three, you know, okay players, then yes, the, the price to acquire Donovan Mitchell will be more than that. So that is already a godfather off. Okay, so let, let, me, let me rephrase that question. Sure. Is it, is anybody actually going to make that, that godfather offer? offer? Okay, there's a, well, first of all, there was a, there's a really funny moment during the trade frenzy when Someone in a position to know Fat Joe said Donovan Mitchell had told Fat Joe <laughs> that actually Donovan Mitchell wanted to play for the Miami Heat. And then Fat Joe went on the record to rebut that report, but did it in the third person saying <laughs> Fat Joe never said that. So... Um, I'm sure I'm sure Miami would love to acquire Don. Don't you want to play for the Knicks? Yeah. Look, the, the, uh, the reports coming out of the Knicks, on mm -hmm. the other hand, are that they're not exactly sure how, or it's not specifically this. It's like right now they are keeping their powder dry, and I personally wonder how well. A Donovan Mitchell, Jalen Brunson, who they just acquired backcourt would hold up defensively, considering mm -hmm. they like both Brunson and Mitchell spent the spent last year's playoffs at targeting one another on defense. True. So I I don't I mean yes you could probably include Jalen Brunson in that package, but part of the enticement to bring Jalen Brunson to New York was you're going to be the man mm. and bring in Donovan Mitchell to play alongside him would sort of run contra to that. And using him as part of the package to acquire Donovan Mitchell would run even further, which they can't do. They can't trade him till December anyway, because they just signed him. Um, so yes, I'm sure the New York front office is as Kevin Durant was monitoring the situation in Utah and seeing what kind of trade packages emerge. I don't know if you, I don't know if the Knicks, despite the fact that, Donovan Mitchell's dad works for the Mets, and Donovan Mitchell is a does Mets he? fan. Yeah, he does. Donovan Mitchell's dad. What does he do? Uh, it's it's some kind of uh, it's not like a high level. For, I forget the actual job title. Jamie, <laughs> Jamie, 
When was he hired by the Mets? Was he a Cohen hire? Or was he pre? Did he? No, he's been Cohen? around for a while. It's been, okay. it's been it's not a recent hire. It's not like the Mets hired him to entice Donovan Mitchell. That's to what come I was. This York. is some really, really forward thinking by Cohen. No, yeah. no, no, no. Uh, they, they, they just. Uh, uh, but like, no, he grew up in New York, in the New York, greater New York mm. area. So Donovan Mitchell's been a Knicks fan for a while, which is why he's been so. That's 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 bad. Yeah, Donovan Mitchell, there, there were, again, reportedly, mm. factions of <laughs> the Phil Jackson front office that very much wanted to draft Donovan Mitchell with the seventeenth, with the ninth pick in 2017. Mm. And he had supposedly a very impressive workout prior to the draft. Donovan, mm-hmm. Mitchell was, Donovan Mitchell went about where he was predicting to go in that draft. New York took... I'll let you guys guess who New York took instead. I don't need to ask. Is that Nilakina draft? Is that the Nilakina one? That's the Nilakina draft. Yeah. That's I was so draft. I was so high on that pick. I thought, look, I liked the pick at the time. Everyone said Nilakina is going to take a couple of years to develop, but no one. But that was also where he was projected to go. No one was screaming about it being a massive reach or anything like that. Many people wanted uh, Dennis Smith Jr., who I don't know if he'd been allowed to start in New York his whole career and didn't have to suddenly change his entire game playing against Luka Doncic. Maybe things would have been different for Dennis Smith Jr., but that's uh, that's some alternate timeline stuff that we'll never know in any case. So, yes, there are a lot of uh, narrative threads connecting Donovan Mitchell to New York. Reportedly, for now, given the current roster makeup of the team, he's not a target who might be interested in him? I don't know. I don't think anybody connected the Minnesota Timberwolves to Rudy Gobert until yesterday. So Yeah. I just don't think there's a lot of teams that are going to put all their... I, I don't think he's at that... I don't think he flips a lot of these teams that are close. Like I don't think they see him as a two-way player that will get them over the hump. And I don't... I don't know. I like Donovan Mitchell, but I do think... I like think... Donovan Mitchell, too, but there are limitations to being yeah. a 6'1 scoring guard. Right. I just don't think... He's already 25, I think. Yeah, the team to do it would be like a Portland situation where they bring, they give away all their assets that they've acquired and they just are like, hey, we'll just see what happens with Dame and Mitchell here late at the end of Dame's prime. I mean, Portland, like... Portland, Portland could be a playing team this year. Yeah. I mean... They re-signed Nurkic for a lot. Mm. 470 yeah, Jeremy Grant. a lot. They have Jeremy Grant. They got uh, Jason Hart, who I always like. Josh Hart. Josh, Josh Hart. Why are mm. I think Jason? there was a Jason Hart in the NBA, though. There was a Jason. Maybe. Yeah. Jason Jamie. Smith. He was a Nick. Remember We're Jason Smith? i Jason Smith. I hate Jason Smith. <laughs> I think what I described. He, he just, he just got I, boards. He yeah. I think I, I, mm-hmm. I'm fairly sure I described Jason Smith in print or in in a digital media publication as a walking jar of expired mayonnaise. <laughs> I never, I really dislike Jason Smith. That's mean. That's really yeah, mean, Yeah, I was Bob. mean to him. He didn't do anything to hurt me. I just yeah. didn't like him. I didn't like watching him play sports on my team. Um, mm. That's the difference between old media case, and new media. New media doesn't talk to... Oh, Josh God. Hart. Josh Hart, Jeremy mm-hmm. Grant, Yusuf Nurkic, Dame, re-signed Anthony Simons, New so yep. little, you know, the, I think Ben McLemore might hang around again. They've got all of those, uh, you know, all those players who I can't recall right Zach now. Zach Collins? Starting for them. Greg Brown. Zach Collins got traded. Did he? He San Antonio. Yeah. Oh, that's right. He did. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They've got, that's, that's a best. They re-signed their kids, yeah. they got a possible playoff team there. I don't, I don't know. The West is tough, man. I, I They're a playing team play-in at the most. Team. Yeah, yeah, at the most. At the most. Okay, so but, so right now there is not a clear market for mm-hmm. Donovan Mitchell, you know, and and I think the the smart move for the Jazz would be not to go full tanking for Victor Wembanyama, but hold on to Dame and see what happens. Mm-hmm. Not Dame. Hold on to Mitchell. Wait for more offers to materialize. See what the market will bear. My favorite thing, uh, I don't know. What like we'll end it on this. What do you think? Do you think Mitchell stays or is he on another team on opening night? Because I don't think he gets traded after that. Like once they decide they pivot, he's he's going to be there. What do you think, Andrew Hammond? Mm-hmm. I'm poking you. Answer Give the me the question. deadline. I mean opening night. No, um, no, I, no. I, I know that. I'm just saying trade deadline. Okay. 
I just don't yeah. think guys move like that anymore at the trade deadline. If he doesn't move now, there, I don't think he moves. There may be a team that will be, you know, they'll be close to a top four and maybe put themselves, th- think that, the, okay, we need one more piece to get us into finals contention. I think his value's down, though. If he's playing on a bad Mitchell? Utah team next yeah. year, I think you get less if you wait till the deadline. I think you get a lot more now than you do in February. Does he even want to be there? That's my question. Well, at this point, I mean, look, there was, there was, it was fairly clear that there was some kind of a rift between him and Gobert, mm-hmm. that, that, an irreparable one. So now, that we're, and now that Gobert's gone, and management has said this is your team, Brandon, mm. he's playing. I don't even know who's left. There's, you know, Conley's still there. But I'm going to love the pick and pop there. with him and Walker Kessler. Like Kessler as, was putting that up at Auburn, yeah. As as you know, Wendy said. <laughs> That was traded, just fantastic, uh, yeah. That was a delightful bit of NBA Twitter weirdness. The Brian Winkworth meme day. I just love how Wonderful. He, I love how he said a lot of nothing. And everybody he said home, absolutely nothing. <laughs> everybody said you thought was going to make a trade. Mm-hmm. Probably, uh, and, you know, I think everybody knew that Gobert was going to go. They just didn't know what or how or what what or how. And he didn't certainly say Gobert is going to go to a a team that you wouldn't expect. He gave zero hints of like, he didn't, he's not, you know, Nostradamus. He predicted nothing. All he did was, you know, do a very long monologue from Columbo. And everyone thinks, (laughs) and because it was very funny the way he did it, it was it was some real Stephen A. Smith hours in terms mm-hmm. of the timing and the syntax of the monologue, and I respect it. It was, but I love how, like, there, because there were, like, some NFL insiders, or at least I saw one that was like, oh, we could never do this on, on, on our network, and basically they were just kind of complaining really? that they were, they were basically just complaining that he gave a two-minute just monologue that was nothing that had barely any substance at all. And they were just like, oh, we, it was like, we couldn't get away with something like this. I'm like, and, and yeah, he got aggregated. Because he consciously, is aggr- he consciously fed himself to the aggregation hordes. Good yeah. job, Brian Winters. Like, I it's, just, I think it was, it was fun. It was hilarious. And it made for some very funny memes. And I it, posted, so I posted memes that I thought. There, there you go. There, Did you see was... the A B C D E F G H I J K L M N O P? That like it, with the different stills from it. When horse like is pretty funny. Who said it. I like the person who set the entire monologue to a Hans Zimmer song. Yes. yes. I forget which one that one was. Really it was Mountains. I want to say he was yes, a Twitter Mountain. main character one day this week too, wasn't he? And is it Ooh. Hans Zimmer or Hans? Hans? I always thought it was Hans. 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 Okay. Hans. Hans chimed mm-hmm. in. I think. On, Zimmer, uh, on the Supreme yeah, Court he, he he popped out of nowhere yeah. and he had a take. What was it? He was a main character one day on oh, Twitter. No. It wasn't main. He did have some thoughts about our current politics. And yeah. It got picked up and everyone went, oh. Hans so Zimmer's got some takes. Uh, <laughs> was it, so was it, the, was it the type of take that's uh, like, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, so was he like the main character for normal Twitter, or was he the main character for I'm offended by everything right wing Twitter? Because they will make you a main character for everything. No, I, I think it. I think I think yes, it went into the more politics Twitter uh, turf. Mm-hmm. It wasn't. It wasn't even that spicy a take, if I recall. I don't remember what it is. So. It was more that Hans either. Zimmer is just out here putting his takes on it's Twitter.com just, it's now. It's just that, yeah, nobody saw some Hans Zimmer takes coming. Uh, you it's never like know. Hans Zimmer has entered the chat. Wait, what? Yeah. Um, um, Kevin Durant um, only wants to play. And now Kevin Durant. On teams that he yeah. wants, but without people giving up players. I love this. Kevin Durant only wants to play, with, play for Heat with Jimmy Butler, Kyle Lowry, and Bam at a bio. Okay, but, Kevin. Um, that's not how any of that would work. I, I don't you just I respect it. I in a way, I respect all of what he's doing at this moment. Like he signed the extension and then he get he backstabs Kyrie 
He backstabs the Nets, and then he's like, by the way, I'm only going to the Suns or Nets. I'm giving you a trade. Well, it's a little odd that he wants, that he gave. Uh, It's a bit, uh, it it depends on what his motivations are. Mm -hmm. If you believe the reports that he wants to somehow turn himself and Kyrie into a package deal to play, to team up again somewhere else, then not really. It just seemed, the timing of it was a little odd that he wait, that Kyrie spent, that one afternoon of leaked reports from the Nets camp and Kyrie's reps about whether he would just become a free agent and take, you know, the taxpayer mid-level or the mid-level exception from some team for a year. And then everyone's had to say, well, actually, he's the president of the union. Mm. No, he really can't do that. He could, but it would be, it would certainly not be an act of solidarity with the rank and file or anything like that. But Mm. there was this day going back and forth where everyone had to hear these, you know, shams inflected reports and stuff about, uh, about what Kyrie was going to do. And maybe he would just walk and then he did opt into the final year. So now Kyrie for one year is, I would say a little bit more, has more has more options to go somewhere than Kyrie trying to peddle his services on the open market with a limited number of contending teams with the cap space to actually sign him and in it being a near impossibility that he would take, you know, a thirty million dollar a year haircut. Mm. So Kevin did wait until Kyrie w- had lost a lot of his leverage before making this announcement. Although reports are that this is not, it's not like Durant knocked on the boss's office and said, hello, I would like to be somewhere else now. But this is something the Nets have known for a bit of time. Mm. Two weeks, I think, is the report. So, look, it's, it's uh, Kevin Durant is you know, almost everything about Kevin Durant that doesn't have to do with his actual job performance is incredibly grating and kind of frustrating. Mm -hmm. Um, And I hope he gets traded somewhere that's his last team. (laughs) I just, I don't, I'm I'm quite exhausted hearing about Kevin Durant's various moods and feelings about things. Uh, All I'm going to say is... Say it. The way way this week is going... I've never wanted to side with the owners in a labor dispute, but man, man. but they, they are like the way NBA players are acting this week. They are, I'm like, you know, it's true. It is, it is, it has certainly swung public, like public sentiment has absolutely pivoted towards the right of a worker to choose his place of employment but i it, it was weird it was all the old backlash of these in like a four-year contract is meaningless and how could you do this to a team and if why would you sign that if you just are just if you're just going to tear it up when it suits your whims and there was a there was a bit of an anti-labor backlash and i get where it's coming from what i, I still don't agree with it but i get oh it. yeah absolutely not but i'm over here like uh guys you are you are giving the owners a ton of ammo when it comes to negotiations. And oh boy, Kyrie at the negotiating table in a year or two. But see, like there's nothing you can negotiate out of this where you can't force these guys to treat the contracts, the four-year contracts, as four-year contracts. Like they can go no. back to one ver- one 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 and ones, and they can just pivot. They'll just be like, "We'll just do that instead. We won't do." Th-. Yeah. Like, I mean, th- some players want that kind of stability. They want to know, like, okay, sure, my knee turns to crab meat. I'm still getting right paid some players want that I, I don't think we should go back to one on one i don't think that's fair either i mean i'm yeah. not saying i want that but i'm saying they can pivot i think the players can pivot around i don't think you're going to be able to put the toothpaste back in the tube in terms of players not looking at or big time players not looking at contracts as just we'll figure it out and we know we can get around it we can make life and the day-to-day life miserable enough that you'll you'll move it you'll move this contract like you'll figure out a way to appease us and it's like one of those things where, look, we understand that player I mean, empowerment is good. The converse is like, well, you know, 
when everyone says, well, yeah, but the owners are honoring their contractual commitments. And I'm like, yes, yeah, sort of. But Rudy yeah. Gobert is working in Minneapolis right now. And I don't know if that's what he wants, but he has zero choice in the matter. Um, I think it's, I, 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 on, I get the sentiment, especially if you were a fan of the Brooklyn Nets. Mm. You know, all five of them. <laughs> um, but... Well, it's the same. It's it's one of those things where it one of the most frustrating things about the college football conversation um, over the last two years is that, like, look, the portal and um, NIL and all of these things can be good for the player and you can support that. But you can also acknowledge that it's bad for the game and bad for fans. Like, you can say expansion. Speaking, like, of, speaking of bad for the game, I'll let yeah. you guys cover this because this is your field of expertise. Well, but, I mean, it kind of blends in. So with now there are two mega conferences and that's it? I mean, we're that's not there it. yet. but that's We're not where, there yet. Uh, I, 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 I saw that this was in the document that I didn't look at. So yeah. I just wanted to know if we were ready for that. Well, we're not there yet because ultimately the ACC and the Big 12 and the Pac-10 or Pac-12 have to decide how they keep this thing moving. Like they're kind of screwed with the TV revenue and what their media rights deals look like. But I think Pac-12 right. is about to negotiate. So we'll see uh, if they get in. Andrew's ready to go here. Um, Andrew, has some, Andrew has some college football thoughts. I can see it in, his, in the glint of his eye. I know. Um, and his chin jutted forward. He's doing he this for the folks on YouTube. He's up deep inside and he's doing all he can to... To, to let them marinate and to I will, launch one into the stratosphere. Go for we, it. We, we can continue with the current discussion. I just... No, um, there's not much to say. Like, Durant's going to go somewhere. I have a feeling it's going to be... There were some reports today that the Nets are negotiating in the public are not... They can't trade Booker. Booker cannot, by the laws... Can I, mean, I tell you where he goes? I know where he goes. You're get, you're sending where? him to New Orleans. They're getting Brandon Ingram and stuff for him, and they're going to do the KD and Zion thing, and they'll trade everybody else but him. They have so many young assets, and they, they have, have so many guys. Congratulations guys. on buying the four seed. I mean, Who, the Nets or the Pelicans? Oh, no, 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 no. The Pelicans with... Uh, Durant Zion and Zion and is... And, and yeah, Durant that's... and whomever is left hanging around yeah. there. That's... Like they, I don't think CJ McCollum's going to be a part of the deal. So I think yeah, so those three, those three, like they're the, the Nets, favorites in the West immediately. What? Yeah, the, not I don't, they're the favorites in the West. I think they would be very good. A healthy yeah, Zion think, and a healthy Kevin Durant I, in a seven-game I, I series okay, is just. I tend to lean like say? on situations like these, the player's going to go where the player wants to go. So I think it's going to be Phoenix. I, yeah. I mean, they, it'll be like it'll be something along the lines of Cam Johnson who I think could be extremely good, Mikhail Bridges and DeAndre Ayton in a Simon trade. Do you, and, think, do you think that there's going to be more than two teams in this deal? Because that's what it feels that's like. It feels what like they, they're that's to what the report I saw this money was. They're trying third. to rope in a third team. Uh, but I still think he ends up in Phoenix. I don't think he's going to yeah. in New Orleans. But why would you acquiesce for Kevin Durant? Like, if you, we were just talking about, like, how owners, like, and how GM should look at this whole situation. It's like, no, you're going to Sacramento, man. Like, if we get the best wow, deal. That's, Kyrie. Okay. that's more yeah, like okay. Kyrie, though, right now. Chase, yeah. when, was, when was the last time an NBA player made a demand like this? Mm. Didn't, where, did it, where did Anthony Davis end up going? Where did, that's true. I mean, there was a... Where did where did uh, where did Paul George end up going? That's true. That's I mean you can poo poo this whole. I really do believe that all the the, the, the you know the presidents of basketball operations when they look mm -hmm. at this and they think okay, there will be negotiations with our players moving forward. There will be negotiations with all kinds of free agents. There will be trades moving forward. There will be a lot. There's a lot of capital to be built up by and by not banishing a Kevin Durant to some NBA hinterland mm. and doing it seemingly out of spite, doing it even just because it's the best return they could get on the trade. Mm -hmm. That they feel like whatever net gain they have by accepting the best possible package will over the long haul cost them. Because agents do get vindictive about stuff like that. They think, why would I arrange for my for my client to go here if they're going to be made miserable? And players talk to one another. But then I you think, you respond with, well, you locked into the contract, and then you went and immediately. Yeah, you, you can't logic your way yeah. out of this. Mm -hmm. 
I think Kevin Durant is going to go where Kevin Durant wants to go, and they'll figure out a way. That's but that's how you lose people in the league. That's how you lose fans. That's how you piss people off. Like that's just if Kevin Durant is able to do that over and over. I'm, I, I'm not it's also just that like can we also talk about like conversation about declining NBA viewership or anything like that. Well, I, it's not I, declining I, NBA viewership, but it's just more of like I think the bouncing around is just <laughs> there's a reason does. that a lot it of does. People, yeah. It does. Over the long haul, it does do that. But agents, their job is not to... They, they, their job is not worrying about NBA fan interest. Their yeah. job is worrying about the, the sort of interest of their clients. That's, that's a good reason for that. Oh, it, you mean you, you, you mean player uh, freedom and uh, the, the whole player empowerment era may have actually... <laughs> may have actually turned into some bad faith, uh, some bad faith action. I mean, it's a longer conversation, but I mean, weirdo Twitter junkies like me <laughs> love days like Friday where the fit hits the shan. Uh, we mm. love that stuff. That was fun for me. Oh, was, oh you're talking I about was, like Wendy and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yeah, fun. not just the Wendy stuff, but all of the speculation about where did this trade come from? What is the value of the trade? Where will he go? Yeah. Okay, where will Kevin Durant go next? Will the Nets like is the market drying up for Kyrie to the point where they have to send him back into the loving embrace of LeBron James and the Los Angeles Lakers? Like all of that, all of the this li- hashtag this league stuff that the diehards who spend too much time on the internet really dig probably does turn off a percentage of the population who just wants to watch a game and then has to go wait who's on the roster now Mm -hmm. wait this guy's playing there when did that happen this is college football but college football is in way more dire straits in this regard where it's like every the portal where it was already it was usually you had an idea of where people were on the best teams now with the portal that so it's so hard to be a casual college football fan now because you have no idea where anybody is unless it's your job to keep up like there's gonna like in the oregon georgia game there are gonna be so many college football fans that tune in and they're like is that bo nix under center for oregon i mean like auburn quarterback bo nix is at oregon and i think a lot of casual fans probably just have no idea that that happened that he just entered the portal after three years at uh starting at auburn it's just that kind of stuff is that's the antithesis of why folks want to watch. They want to watch because they like want to fall in love with their guys for four right. years and they're gone. Like that's part of the appeal. And you get like, hey, this is better for the player. But like understand you lose fans like that because ultimately they want to be able to follow the sport, understand the sport, understand right. where and things it are going. It shouldn't feel once it feels like work. Yes. People are gonna stop doing it. It is work to keep up with what college football is. And it's work to keep up with who's on who in NBA. And then like the protected picks, unprotected, the lottery, understanding the I've uh, got the, the Larry Kuhn CBA yeah. explainer bookmarked, but it is 125 chapters long. And yes. I can't parse it without the help of a a, a, a decent economist or a right. accountant. It's very confusing. Yeah. And part of the what part of the reason the NFL is king and will remain king, but this is something they have to get they have to be very, very careful about, and this starts with Kyler probably, is that when you have a quarterback, when you draft the franchise quarterback in the NFL, you expect to have that guy for over a decade where you can just latch on and you have that guy for a decade. You will watch, and that is like the best feeling of any sports fan is when you have the franchise quarterback year over year, but if Kyler and guys like Kyler who come into this league and then after a couple years they're like this isn't working and they start moving around if you have quarterback movement in the NFL in their prime that's a huge the, huge okay, issue but, okay but you know in the late 2000s when uh, Brett Favre was doing his Garber routine about he was already he was past his prime Favre. no that was that was past his prime Brett Favre that was right. how many okay. years did Favre I'm saying like if you do yeah, it within your first and second contract every year about, about promising to be yeah like, I'm there, saying there was a point like after 2003 2004 where he was kind of pontificating do I want to stay do I want it wasn't as public but he was going through that phase because they drafted Aaron Rodgers and he was just like, wait, y'all really drafted on the quarterback? And it's like, yeah, how dude. Many did, how many years did Aaron Rodgers sit before he got the starting job? Was it three? Three or four years, yeah. It was three. I think it about was three. three. 
I thought he that? started his third year. Maybe I'm wrong. I thought he started his third year. I'd have to think. Jamie, Jamie, <laughs> get on. I thought he sat too full. I, I could be wrong. He might have. He might have played sparingly, mm. but I, I I do remember like there was this point where, like, because it was after they lost to the Rams in the playoffs, and mm. he he threw like six interceptions in that game. He was crap. And there were these, you know, discussions. Oh, has he played his last game? You know, clearly he's on the downturn of his career. Uh, so, like, what what does all of this mean? And then, yeah, we went through that whole song and dance for like a three four year stretch. He sat for three, by the way. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rogers sat for three years. I mean, look, it used to be decades ago. The old saw was any quarterback who's drafted, even a potential all-timer needed to sit for five years and mm. learn the nuances of the game behind the established veteran that was just sort of considered the norm mm. that you could well, not the veteran was halfway decent. The fire. you if couldn't they, throw a rookie quarterback into a starting in, in with the starting 11 or else you would damn them to oh, so ter- also terry bradshaw before 1974 yeah i yeah. mean that, should, have kept, should have kept playing jim, jim gilliam well, I'm yeah old. well <laughs> There were reasons he wasn't playing. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, yeah. I don't know what uh, they are. Yeah. It, it escapes the, me right now. Well, um, I mean, there was <laughs> there, there there was one reason why a lot of people didn't want to give him a chance. But then there were like a few other reasons why it was like, uh, do we want to? No. But it, the way the NFL is now where you basically, if you're going to draft a rookie quarterback, either one of two things happens. You they, put him around yeah. vets, and he eventually starts, you know, maybe halfway through his rookie season. Or I whatever. think, yeah, unless they're a real Trey Lance type prospect where everyone assumes that they were playing, they don't have any idea how to run a pro style offense. And all the top guys are getting, they're being handed the reins from Jump Street. I well, mean, and, 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 and offenses and NFL teams have realized, oh, and, maybe yeah, college, we need to college teams are off. doing that. I mean, college teams are doing this too. They're running. Like the sets they're running aren't that dissimilar from the stuff in the pros, if only because all of the, the, you know, the air raid principles have been imported into the pros now anyway. Yeah. So. Well, and See, it's, I'm a college football knower. I, and, I got and, it. And the NFL realized, man, maybe we should tailor our stuff to the college kids because, you know, the it NFL works. is always 15 to 20 years behind figuring uh, out what's next. Great league you got. <laughs> I think no, you just add was, elements think, where it's like you can't just fully adopt I, the uh, the Texas I think Tech. With the, the NFL, the no, NFL, you can never do that. No. Yeah. Um, the NFL, look, yes, with regards to okay, do I as a casual fan need to pay attention to the transaction wire in order to figure out where Kevin Durant is heading and why, in yeah. order to enjoy just the the immediate pleasures of watching Kevin Durant play? Yes. The NFL, I would say, has a much lower barrier for entry when it comes to a kind of entertainment. And I think a lot of the ways in which the amount of player movement and or the lack thereof, I think, does absolutely benefit, benefit casual NFL viewership. I would argue that it has to do a lot more with there being only, you know, that the game times are set and there's only one mm-hmm. week. And the the fun of the NFL is, it's I think people. I think experience. you're discounting like Josh Allen versus Patrick Mahomes, and that like was, that was extremely cool. That was yeah. awesome. Everybody loved that. And I think people want that for years. They want the rivalry, and like Buffalo Bills fans are packing. Like it, they just know that they're in it every year that Josh Allen's in his prime. But if Josh mm-hmm. Allen go, went to the negotiating table every year and he's like, "Oh, me and Diggs, we just we don't see eye to eye. I need you to it, unless Diggs is out, I'm out." Oh, That's oh you, mean like, you mean like a certain team in the uh, NFC North? That Here's the difference. Name. Rogers gave over a decade. I know what no, you're talking about. I'm, t- I'm talking about Minnesota. Oh, who are you talking about? With uh, Diggs, Diggs and, and Cousins? And Cousins yeah. yeah. Well, the difference, yeah, but- Cousins and Minnesota fans, they know Kirk Cousins is not like the, the franchise guy. He wasn't drafted by Minnesota. He was traded. Like he was, he was, uh, he was after the fact. Yeah, but, but when you have Stephon Diggs and... Mm-hmm. You should probably, hey. I mean, it worked out. Justin Jefferson's pretty awesome. Yes, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I I, I love Justin Jefferson, but at the end of the day, 
you still have a guy that is 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 he going to be? We're 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 still having questions about the same guy for the last three years. Yeah, but that's not really a Diggs Jefferson issue. That's more of a management with Kirk Cousins and paying Kirk Cousins issue. Um, Let's not talk about it. I mean, you're a playoff team again, Andrew. This year, <laughs> like that's good. You're another. You're a playoff that team NFC again. North is going to be trash. It's going to be completely different where the two bottom teams are really bad and the Vikings and the Packers have both win do- double digit games. Mm. I will say this. Mm -hmm. I think the Lions are playing competitive football into the first week of November. But that's but and that's that's from the point of you improved at the end of the regular season, but man, that division takes a few steps back. It'd be nice if Jamison Williams was available out the gate, but he will not be. Uh, it's going to be a bad division. Justin Fields, they didn't do much. Just Speaking of, game. like that's the, if you want to get some value on first coach fired, Matt Eberflus in Chicago is actually... No, no, so the Steve no. Wilkes thing, I I would not be surprised if he gets Steve Wilkes, where if that offense, and it's bad, that offense <laughs> is bad. And if Justin Fields is awful next year, and if that offense is unwatchable... This, it's just not... Defensive They're, coaches don't last long when the offense sucks and they don't have good quarterback yeah. play. They just don't. That, you don't get a long leash. I get that, but at the same time, I don't think – he'll he's going to get at least two years. We say that, man, no. but if you're historically bad offensively and you're a defensive-minded coach, we, there's a precedent set that get, they will move on. The Dolphins won eight straight games and still moved on from Flores because well, Tua was not developing. I mean, let's, Again – and there are reasons. <laughs> well, yeah. I think the I there are reasons and there's a lot of nuance involved there, but I will I will still maintain that if Tua was playing really well down the stretch and that offense looked good and he had not fumbled the offensive coordinator hires like they went in with co-coordinators last year, then I think he's still around. But I think because they finally drafted Tua and they had this guy that they're like we have to figure out if he's a franchise guy, they there was just a disconnect and he didn't believe in Tua. So if he wanted Watson and didn't believe in Tua, if that's the the reporting on it is just that like he was not in on Tua, then they're going to side with the quarterback every time over the defensive minded coach, unless you're like Bill Belichick. And even then, the quarterback doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you win six Super Bowls, you can you get yeah. a lot of. He <laughs> might pick you over the quarterback. You get a pretty um, long leash. Exactly. Um, well, college wall a minute, Andrew, you were ready. Here's your, here's your minute, Bob. This is, you'll learn something here. Oh, Poking God. Andrew to make sure mm-hmm. he gets the take. Poke, yeah, poke, no. Poke, um, poke. So this, and people have been saying, oh, mm-hmm. it was this moment that started the domino effect. It was that moment that started the domino effect. The real domino effect started 1991. You had... Arkansas and South Carolina going to the SEC. They expanded to uh, 12 teams. And then you had Penn State, who was a lifelong independent, going to the Big Ten. And that's where all of this started. This expansion, this need for territory, resources, market share, all this crap. Regional college football died earlier this week. It was already dead, but it was, but it's basically just done now. Uh, the West Coast, USC and UCLA are now in the Big Ten, and this is pretty much the Fox answer to ESPN picking up uh, or adding Oklahoma and Texas to the SEC, like. Everything that's been happening over the last decade should not shock anybody. Like the we were we've always been headed towards this type of Armageddon moment where the two networks or the two company two media companies, Fox and ESPN, which portions of Fox are owned by Disney. So basically, it's just, you know, Mickey Mouse in in the Disneyland castle just playing with like a marionette type thing. Yay. Um, Look, I've been on record saying that it was probably going to be 
by the end of the decade, we would see the eventual uh, ESPN brand of college football teams and the Fox brand of college football teams speed that timeline up to about 2025. And I don't think anybody's. I like this take. I don't. I don't think anybody is going to be. And that's the that's the thing. Nobody is going to be kicked out of conferences. That's not going to happen. Because one, financially, yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of there are a lot of contracts and agreements that can't be just immediately torn up. Yeah. And, there are, and like, there are financial there are there are financial commitments beyond just football. Yeah. That make that very, very well very this is different. the other part of it too. Like they're gonna run into Title Nine stuff. Like this is part yeah. of I, I'm waiting for that shoe to drop where this much revenue going to tight like how Title Nine plays in football doing what they're doing right now and making all of these decisions based on football. Because it's, it's this is what scares me the most is like this really this screws what, over every other sport. It's what destroyed Big East basketball. Mm-hmm. Uh, like oh, when they tried to make ago. it a football conference. Yeah. Yes, two decades, like three decades ago, when they decided they wanted that football. Boise league. State was in the Big East. San Diego yeah. State was in the Big they East. They were they were there for like two minutes, and then people realized, right. oh, this is a really bad fucking idea. Yeah. I mean, it was an idea that there was money to be made, and now the Big East is gone. So, well, it's it's somewhat back in basketball. I, 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 pretty good I, I, I do enjoy the right fact now. that I do enjoy the fact that UConn people are like clamoring to hold on or clamoring to go into the ACC now. It's mm. like dog that there, there's like a Category Five tornado that's about to hit the ACC's house. I was do talking you to really want to move here. Well, I was talking to Chris Coleman of Tech Sideline, who covers Virginia Tech, and he's pretty plugged in. And I didn't realize how many like how many different conferences in Virginia Tech's history where they've been everywhere, oh, and they're not concerned yeah. about any of this. Where they're like, they I don't have, care. They've also been to Big East school. Yeah, they've been Big East. East. They've West, been West Virginia, independent. They've been everything. West Virginia yeah. is like the most pissed off in all of this because they're just like, we were sold on a bill of goods, and for again, by the way, because they went to the Big East. Um, mm. cause they were, they actually used to be in the Southern conference. Uh, and then they went to the big East, which mm. it's like everything that they've been involved with. You're just like poor, poor West Virginia. I mean, the big 12 most travel. I mean, those, the travel for big 12, like I imagine the non-football I mean, the, the mountaineer tra- teams. Just the tra- I mean, the travel for all of those big East schools and, and for USC and UCLA, when you've got. Again, it's not just one sport. You're talking about hauling kids. Yeah. A lot of kids Volleyball kids on a Tuesday from Piscataway, New Jersey to Southern California and then coming back. Like the, the, so how are they doing school? What, like, what how is any of this happening? What they'll how is probably school do is, and, and they did this in, uh, they do this in the Pac 12 because <laughs> people forget the Pac 12 stretches from Seattle to uh, Arizona. Canada. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so that's very long. So mm-hmm. what they do is, if you're gonna go, say, if you if you're Washington State, and you've got to play at Arizona on a Thursday, you're gonna be at Arizona on Thursday, either Saturday or Sunday, you're gonna be at Arizona State. So you're you're gonna see more of that. But the problem is those those pairing weekends that you would normally have, since schools are relatively close, it's gonna be really weird now. I think you can get away with it in um, – I think you can get away with it in Olympic sports because if you're volleyball, you can just make that trip every – you know, teams can make that trip, go to L.A., get both L.A. schools on a weekend, come back. But now you're thinking in terms of women's basketball. You're looking at wrestling. You're looking at – baseball you're looking at i look at tennis to me tennis is going to be very fascinating because you end up going on the road and a lot of these and the one thing that people don't realize is that a lot of the non-olympic sports or the the olympic sports they don't go they don't have direct flights 
A mm. lot of these schools don't have direct flights, or if they do, you know, congratulations. It's, it's great, but, you know, you're in an airport. Like, I've seen, I think it was Georgia or, you know, Georgia Tech. Mm. I saw Georgia Tech volleyball in an airport just kicking it one day. <laughs> and you're just like, wait a minute, where are they flying to? I think they're they were flying to, like, Tallahassee or something. It was some, it was somewhere on the coast, but you know, they aren't flying direct and God mm-hmm. forbid, you know, the other aspect. Well, there's not a direct flight in a lot of these towns. Like Knoxville yeah. is a, you fly out of Knoxville. Guess what? You're flying. You're, you're, it's a two part thing. Like you're flying somewhere and then you're getting on another, pl- another plane yeah. and flying somewhere else. Like happy Valley and all that. Like there's just no direct well, flights there. Like you, uh, you know, I, I used this example on another pod earlier mm-hmm. this week. You go from, if you're Texas tech, mm-hmm. You got to go up to West Virginia. You don't sometimes fly directly into Morgantown. Mm. You're going to Pittsburgh and then you're driving back down. So like this is, and think about the equipment guys. Think about th- those yeah. equipment trucks that are going all, they're already going a day, day and a half, maybe two days before. If you are UCLA you got to go to Purdue in mid November. You're driving that equipment truck across the country. You get stuck on an I 70 pass. And, you know, it's snow packed. You're screwed. So, I mean, the, there, there's so many logistical things that need to be brought into play. But the fact that we are here at this point should shock nobody. But, but, I will keep Bob awake, and I have a playoff theory. Uh oh! I think we can solve this. Eventually, it's going to be a new Big Ten and a new SEC. Like there will not be a third brand, mainly because. The I just think that's going to take a long time. Like, I don't think you're going to be able to I, force them out like that. I didn't no, think. No, it... no, I, I, I don't think you'll be able to force them out. But the problem is, you've got the Big Twelve and the Pac Twelve thinking about teaming up. It's like brother. The Big Ten and the SEC, they're they're three or four moves ahead of you. Yeah. The the moment that. But that's not a bad idea. Like they need to be thinking not, big like that. They not, have to be thinking big like that. But, but the problem is, this is the second year in a row that a conference feels duped. Yeah. Because I was, I was talking. Well, it's to, not they feel duped. They were duped. They were yeah. literally lied to. Like that's a so, that's a thing that happened there. There's just so much. So, oh, it turns out handshake agreements when uh, millions of dollars, oh, billions of dollars are involved, might alliance, not be the best way of so, going about so you, it. So you mean the alliance was a bad idea the entire time? Because well, the alliance was a good idea. Not getting it in writing and not having contractual obligations to this and having like, hey, if you poach our guys, you owe us this amount of money. Yeah. Like you saying you're not going to poach any of our guys. Like that's the agreement is we're not poaching each other and we're not going to do this. Like that the alliance was a good in theory thing, but because they didn't get mm-hmm. anything in writing where they were like, we are not going to let greed override what we want to do here. And then greed override what they were doing and that was it and the and the problem that you've had everything around me and yes great song uh the problem that i have quite frankly is the moment that usc and ucla decided they were going to give up 107 years of conference tradition to chase the bag which you know what i'm not even mad at it Go chase the bag. No, you can't be mad at it. Like, it's okay to be mad at it. Like, why do we, we can acknowledge that it's money motivated, but it's like, yeah, money motivations are pretty bad. Like, generally speaking, (laughs) you're making a lot of money. Now you want to make more. It's like UCLA and USC were making a lot of money in the Pac-12. UNC was kind of a broke boy. UCLA was kind of a broke boy and has been a broke boy. But they could be. Like, that was more of what they were managing fun. Like, there is. Yeah. uh, There's. Well, well, UCLA gets a lot of DOD money, too. Mm -hmm. But the problem that. UCLA ran into and much a lot of Pac-12 teams did is they didn't invest in the network enough or they put too much of their money in a network that never gained barely any traction. So now you're screwed. 
and you can't make a lot of that stuff up on the back end. But my final thought is the moment that those two teams left for the Big Ten, the Pac-12 and the Big 12 should have been in a freaking war room discussing how are we going to save our leagues? Because this is my theory, and this is what I think with the playoff. You're going to have the new Big Ten, which is going to be 30-something plus teams. Yes, it's going to be 30-something plus teams because at the end of the day, that third league cannot sustain itself if they're going to be just fighting for the scraps on the back end of whatever Fox and ESPN don't have. So you're going to have this new Big Ten and this new SEC. Six teams from each top six get in the playoff, 12-team playoff. I don't know. I think what's going to be funny is they're going to reinvent. You remember how like uh, modern day uh, entrepreneurs, they just reinvent things that were already invented. They're going to just reinvent com- commerce divisions where it's like we're going to have the Big Ten, the SEC, and then we're going to have the Pac-12 within the Big Ten. And we're going to have all these different divisions like that's how they'll solve the schedule stuff is they're just going to put all those teams that used to play each other anyway. They're going to be mm. like, oh, you're in the this division of the Big Ten Conference. You're in this division of the SEC. Where- oh, yeah. That's how they're going to flip it. They're going to be like, we reinvented it. And it's like, you mean they're called pods? No, no way. Mm -hmm. I just, (laughs) I'll end on this. I think if I hear one more person tell me that uh, this is money motivated, I might just throw my phone across (laughs) there. I got it. it. Hey, guess what? College football fans got it. Like Colin Cowherd had a podcast about this. And I, I was, I was angry at myself for being this angry about it where it was like, oh, it's great. I, nobody wants to watch Colorado State, Oregon State. They want to watch USC versus Michigan. Okay. Oh, do, are, people are you, in you Colorado, people in Oregon State want to watch those games. There is a complete disconnect between like what the national media and what you want to do on a Saturday versus what college football was literally about, which was that it is a regional sport that people care way more about what's going on in their community guess what tennessee fans care more about beating florida at home than they care about being in the playoff they care more about that than playing on a neutral side against a big power five other conference they will pick that to their grave like every college football fan cares about the regionality more than the national stuff and if i hear one more national person who doesn't go to games and doesn't talk to any other person who actually lives in a community or goes to these games i'm gonna lose my mind can i can i I say something don't lose your mind can i I say something Mm -hmm. real quick Yes. The problem with because re, regional college football has been dead basically since it hasn't the, been dead. That's not a thing. Well, it, no, no, no. What I'm saying is regional yeah. interest. As somebody who lived out on the West Coast, and you know, the the problem is they've turned it into ESPN. I mm-hmm. hate I hate being that guy. With, you know, when we talk about being network driven, I saw it firsthand. If you aren't a You know, if you aren't deemed a glamour team by any of the networks, there's not going to be any interest in you. One reason why everybody's so jacked up about USC, because it's like, oh, great. We can care about college football on the West Coast again. It's like. But that's national. The people on the West Coast, the people in UW, they don't care that you're not getting picked up on national ESPN or Fox games. Like Mm. UW just want to watch UW games. They want to watch Washington State games. Do you think Cougar fans and Pullman really care what kind of national coverage they're getting? No, no, it's not that. It's the fact that the major networks and, you know, the fact that you can tell these stories. ESPN has centered everything on the playoff. Right. They've even which is wrong. Yeah, Yeah. which 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 is wrong. But the problem about that is that marketing strategy and how they built it is that you alienate. If you are not having a playoff caliber mm-hmm. season, nobody cares, and no and nobody should give but you. But see, people still care in the, those regions. I know that, but yeah. what I'm saying is the problem is you run into a team like Utah mm-hmm. who had a fantastic season, who could and should have been one of the biggest stories of the season, and you have all of these teams in like the the you know mid part of the conference the middle part of the leagues they're having these great season and these great stories but what's being said on a afternoon game on abc involving two seven win teams that are 
you know. Wait, why do Utah fans care about that? They don't care. No, but what I'm what I'm saying is, you you put on, you know, you put on Iowa and Wisconsin uh-huh. two thirty game on ABC. Right. It's a it's an important game in the Big Ten West. I was gonna say Big Ten North, but it's, it's an important game in the Big Ten West. And what's and what's being discussed? They're talking about the college football playoff. Why would I want to know about the college football playoff when I'm seeing my team on on the, in a showcase game that's important to the conference, not even the playoff? The problem is they they've centered the playoff so much that you alienate everybody else. For the I just don't think of... you're alienating any people. I just don't think they like it, but they're still keeping up with the regional coverage. They're still going to their rival site. They're still going to their stuff. They're watching but the games. They're not, tailgating. But in terms of the bottom line, in terms of ESPN's bottom line getting in, in the playoff, they've got they've got what they needed in terms of footprint, in terms of exposure, all that. But the problem is you've sacrificed so much coverage from everybody else that – who like at the, there's a point there's gonna be a point this season where your 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 four playoff teams are gonna be Clemson, Ohio State, Alabama, Georgia. Like that's just how it works. But the problem is I don't think Georgia's a playoff team this year. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean hey, you never know, but I'm just saying, but mm-hmm. it's it's one of those things where if you're gonna focus on playoff teams mm-hmm. while you're covering a game that doesn't have to deal with the playoff. But you're basically. Making... I understand what you're saying on that front, and like it, I I understand that. I just don't think that's what. If you like talking to any folks who go have season tickets to their games or are concerned, like none of them are concerned. Like yeah, that it rubs them the wrong way. Will be there, but you're losing the yeah. casual fan. I don't think so. Eh. I don't. How think many so. people were interested in the playoff this year? Like when we realized, oh, it's going to be. Alabama, Georgia. It's a regular season sport. Like none of that stuff matters to every other fan. They've always looked at it that way. Like Washington State fans know that they're not winning a national title. UW fans know that they're not winning a national title. SMU fans know they're not winning a national title. Most schools understand that. They don't care. They just want to beat their rivals. They want to have fun. The problem is perfect example. You look at Cincinnati. Cincinnati. It basically took public, you know, just like, uh, what are you guys doing, denying them from the playoff? Like because. If you remember the first playoff poll that they had, you had Kirk Herbstreit saying, "Well, you know, who is Cincinnati?" Or no, it was the uh, it wasn't Kirk Herbstreit? My bad. It was uh, the playoff uh, committee chair. He's mm-hmm. like, "Well, we well, we really aren't sure what Cincinnati's done." Cincinnati literally went on the road to Notre Dame, and the one—I mean, they weren't one of the four best teams in the country. Like, they were never that. What? They were never that. They were. No, if you put them they up were. against okay, so if we put the oh, they, if we went to they, if you put them against Ohio State, they probably lose the, on a neutral pro- side. If you the put them against is, like, but the problem is, we saw Ohio State was Ohio State a good team last year? Absolutely. What but I'm saying what? is, do you think on a neutral side, Ohio State's not favored against Cincinnati last year? That that doesn't matter well i'm not disagreeing that they had good bona fides to be in the four but like we can all also objectively say that cincinnati was never one of the four best teams in college football last year not even close the mm. third best sec team the fourth like tennessee pro- like would have been right there with cincinnati last year cincinnati would have had problems I, with their tempo problems the, 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 the problem is that we're instead of just putting instead of just giving cincinnati credit for we're what they've Bob. done <laughs> Well, my problem it's is getting, it's getting a little late. I've got I've, I'm on the clock. Here, <laughs> okay. boys. I well, feel I'll like just, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll just say this. this topic, and I don't think you guys are going to find common ground. That's all I'm saying. I'll just say this, and I'll stop. If but it's a nice debate. Give teams, it is. If debate has been embraced. Credit for mm-hmm. doing the work during the regular season, and we aren't pushing a narrative throughout. Mm-hmm. The sport will be better off, but. We can't do that now because everything has been driven and, and controlled by networks. So, uh, like I said, on, which is bad. <laughs> like I said on Wednesday, we're yeah. all on a spinning rock that's going to end up, you know, exploding anyway. So just yeah. enjoy the ride while you can. Eat but I can beans. be mad about it. The people who gleam about it of just like it's money. Who didn't see this coming? It's like great. It's, Glad uh, it's like why we, I hate I hate the people. I think we agree on this. I hate the people that said, "Oh yeah, yeah, of course the." 
of course, like, dude, we all saw this coming. It's just the fact that instead of by the end of the decade, it's happening in like two or three years. Right. There's a political corollary that I could get to, but I'll, I'll, I'll save that. <laughs> Bob's um, like, I'm here for that. Yeah. Hey, Bob. What can we look out for you this week at the Daily Beast or anywhere else? Uh, I've got a story actually. I got a brief. Uh, I got a brief essay in in D Magazine coming yes. out on oh, Tuesday. Nice. Um, that is the a local Texas publication, Dallas publication, uh-huh. uh, about uh, the way that the Knicks and the Mavericks have gotten all up in each other's business the last three and a half years since the Chris Epps mm. gets trade, and it's also about the Brunson trade. And I get deep into my feelings, so be on the lookout for that. Okay, I like it. Tuesday? Tuesday. Tuesday. Andrew, what about you at the Detroit Free Press? Uh, yeah, just summer. Um, Pistons. Summer. Summer. Yeah, well, which is, you know, it's supposed to be the uh, slow time of the year. It's over already. Summer's <laughs> yeah, over already. Sep- already. Yeah, well, fall. and I, I, was, I, I told a friend of mine, I said, uh, yeah, I don't know what a slow time is because if we're going to, you know, NBA Summer League, we – Oh yeah, uh, summer league. Yeah, so summer league. I believe summer league begins. I'm not that much of a sicko. I can't I'm, do it. I, 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 I gotta, I got I gotta eat some tape on Trevor Keels. Mm. Chase, I gotta yeah. know. <sighs> can't oh, do it. What does Trevor yeah. Keels look like? I'm mm. just, I'm just. See, see, Bob, this is if you would watch college basketball, you would understand. I did. I watched Trevor Keels during March Madness. He's a bowling ball sized dude. I dig him. There you go. I love you, Bob. Something I've never been described as a bowling ball sized dude. No, um, you're, an, you're an ectomorph, man. Yes, I no am. No one denies this. <laughs> I am an ectomorph. Um, Bob Silverman, Andrew Hammond, thank you as always, and I will talk to y'all next week.